Okay, we're going to talk about CART analysis or recursive partitions today. Um, CART stands for classification and regression trees. We write that with all capital letters. And they're sort of simple, um, much simpler than running a regression, but in another way, um, they're sort of a very magical kind of calculation that we can have. Um, it does have regression built into it. You can see it's even in its name, but it does a very different uh, kind of thing. So let me start by just mentioning regression. We've talked about multiple regression. We've talked a little bit about variable selection. Um, and we even talked about penalized regression a little bit at the end of that one lab. But we could certainly keep adding more and more complicated ways of doing regression in order to get fancier and fancier models. In general, um, regression models use that algorithm that we talked about, least squares, to choose coefficients of some kind of equation that we can look at. Tree-based predictions instead um, try to make a simple prediction and then slice our data to get better and better predictions. So for instance, if we're trying to predict some y from our x's, um, we're going to make these rectangles. So if you imagine we looked at our Kim data that we've looked at several times, and we looked at the genders, um, about 60 uh, three percent of our respondents were female, which matches Truman's prediction. And so what we would say is if we're given a random person that we don't know, we should predict that they're all female. That would be right 63 percent of the time, which is better than a coin flip, better than just guessing without knowing anything. But it's still not very good. But then imagine we could then split on one variable or another and get two different means or two different predictions that we could work on from that so that we would get different values based on that. And again, we could do it in a couple different ways. And what CART does is it tries all possible splits in order to get the best uh, improvement. So let me do a digression here into this uh, Kim data that we've used now a lot. And um, let's say that we wanted to predict gender. Now, um, in general, this is a weird idea, and typically, um, you know, most people who do science don't try to predict gender. Um, and in fact, if you were in a sociology class, they would tell you lots of reasons why this is a bad idea. However, this is actually a thing that online companies want to do all the time. And they're not trying to predict gender in some sort of political or social way. They just want to guess what they can sell to you. They don't actually care if you identify as male or female. What they really want to know is, do you want to buy mascara? Do you want to watch movies with explosions? Or do you want to watch movies with kissing? Netflix totally does this. They make algorithms that predict whether you're male or female. But they don't use it in the way that I think we normally do. And many people are not you know, strictly uh, binary, not just, again, in the way a sociologist um, or someone in gender studies would talk about, but in a very simple way that there are women who like to you know, watch movies with explosions. So in any case, uh, this is totally a thing that we do. They do it in political campaigns. You can imagine um, that a candidate wants to try to predict what message might work best for you. Now, um, it's probably not that interesting to you to find out that on average, men are taller than women. And that was true in our data set uh, from Dr. Kim as well. Um, knowing that we still know that some women are tall and some men are short, but if you wanted to predict gender, one easy way to do that would be to look at height and just decide everyone above a certain line is predicted to be male and everyone below is predicted to be female. Again, we'd be better than a coin flip, maybe much better. So here's a quick table that I made from the Kim data set. Um, I made this in Google Sheets, but we can make it in RStudio as well. And I highlighted in yellow where a clear kind of split point can be found. In statistics, we call this line a discriminant. This would allow us to say that if we're going to draw a single line and say that everyone is taller than this line, they're male, and everyone shorter than this line, we predict is female. We know it's not going to work perfectly, and we know this is a simple model. But we can just start counting up the true and false predictions and see how we do. So we call the ones that are predicted incorrectly either false positives or false negatives. And uh, here's sort of a cute uh, tree for that or just cute uh, meme for that. So a false positive is when the doctor says that you're pregnant and you aren't, and uh, type two is the other way. And you remember those terms from introductory stats. 
I also want to introduce to you just this quick measure of accuracy. And accuracy is just the idea that if we uh, make a guess, we can uh, figure out how right we are. So again, in that null case, that kind of zero case where we just say everyone's a female, um, then we would say that 203 of our people are uh, female and 163 are male and one uh, did not give their gender. We're gonna leave them out of the equation for now. So our N is 366, not 367. Anyway, if we make our model that everyone is female, um, we're gonna be right uh, 203 out of 566% of the time, and that's about 55%. So again, um, our data is actually less uh, overwhelmingly female than Truman is as a whole, but it still works pretty well, better than a straight 50-50 coin flip, just barely. Now, if we go back to our model here, uh, we can color these by um, how uh, they would do. The green ones are true positives and true negatives, and the red ones are false positives and false negatives. We still didn't decide what to do with the yellow numbers, but um, it's easy to see when you look at it that we should probably predict that everyone who is five foot eight, 68 inches is predicted to be female. But let's do it both ways. And in fact, let's do it wrong first. So we're gonna say that the 68 inch people are assumed to be uh, male. So we can collapse that down. And all I did here was just add up all of our numbers. And uh, when we do that, we can add up how many are right and how many are wrong, both the false negatives and the false positives and we get 293 out of our 366 are now predicted to be uh, female. That's an 80% accuracy rate. That's pretty good, right? So adding in gender, I'm sorry, adding in height gives us a much better prediction than we could get just with our broad naive measure um, to get gender. By the way, speaking of naive, this analysis is called naive Bayes and naive Bayes is how uh, cart trees are gonna work. Now let's fix our yellow numbers and we can get to it uh, here. So down here, we've now correctly identified our chart and you can see by moving those 23 to female and those 10 to male, we've improved our accuracy by about three and a half percent. So that's not bad and that's a pretty good improvement. Okay, <clears throat> so again, this method of slicing is called naive Bayes. And um, as a person who lives on Earth, you're probably not very impressed that our data can tell you that on average, males are taller than females. What's different about a card analysis is that it does this for every single variable in our data set, and it looks at every single uh, breakpoint to try to find where the best split is gonna be. It can then do this recursively multiple times, repetitively, and that's what makes these splits into a tree. Now, before we go on, let me mention the person who didn't give their gender, right? And again, not identifying your gender is fine, but we might want to guess what they're going to do anyway. And again, what kind of things we can sell to them. So this person did report that they're 62 inches uh, tall, five foot two, which is kind of short. The model will predict the person is a female. Of course, we don't know the truth and we'll never know what it really is. But what it does say is that our model's probably gonna recommend sending them as for mascara and not suggesting space action robot movies. That's the start of a classification tree. We're using a binary variable here, male, female, um, but we can use more complicated categoricals um, here in a minute. Before we go on, let me talk about a classification matrix um, because that's one of the things that we're gonna get. So if I flip this data on its side, we get a classification matrix that looks like this. Um, so the idea is we have positive and negative results. In our case, I'm treating female as positive. Um, again, sociologists might uh, wanna weigh in on what positive is. And 178 of the females were identified correctly, 25 were not. <coughs> of those who identified as male, our predictor height mispredicted uh, 35 of them incorrectly uh, predicted 128 of them. So our actual data was 203 to 163. Our predictive model was 213 to 153. Regardless of what we're measuring, a classification, uh, I'm sorry, a confusion matrix works really well to look at that. So this is a simple confusion matrix. There's actually a fancier one um, that I have as a link um, in the 
section here. And what you see is, um, even though the box is the same as what we had here, there are lots of different things we can calculate. And some of these terms uh, we use in simulation analysis, but it's more commonly used in things like clinical trials and other kinds of experiments where you want to compare the model to your predictions. Um, so instead of gender, maybe you want to imagine a medical test where a positive result implies that you have the disease and a negative result implies that you don't. And we'd like to see that people who are identified as having the condition actually have it and those who don't do not. It's the same chart, but now it has a ton of these other predictive rates. Um, a couple I want to mention, one of them is specificity. Um, specific specificity only looks at negative results. So it looks at true negatives out of the ones that are predicted to be negative. And uh, that idea, again, a true negative rate or a specificity is often useful. Other times a true positive rate or sensitivity is what we're really interested in. So um, these sorts of values, positive predictive value is another one we use where we actually look at how many of those who tested positive actually had the condition. Um, uh, there are stories about um, the 1980s where there was a very cheap AIDS uh, test, HIV, uh, that came out, but it had a much too high false positive rate. But because it was so much cheaper, what would happen was they would give you the cheap test, it cost about a dollar um, to give, and if you tested positive on that, they wouldn't tell you you tested positive because, of course, that would freak you out. Instead, they would they'd say is, this test indicates running the second test. The second test was much more expensive, about $100, but it was super, super accurate. And so the first test, which was good in one direction but not the other, was actually really useful because it allowed you to test many more people for a much lower cost. And even today, we still use that test in a lot of our analyses. Okay, so um, I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna make a second video where we go into the next um, details.